Do you remember the boxer Sean Mannion? I, to be honest with you, had not recalled this until I heard about the book Rocky Rosmuk. Uh, and last week I saw a film, a documentary uh, by the same name, Rocky Rosmuk, uh, who uh, that <clears throat> detailed the life and times of Sean Mannion, as well as, and this is, I think, uh, uh, maybe a, a bigger surprise for me, the life and times of the people in uh, both Ireland and in Boston, the Boston area. A fascinating film, and the man who wrote the book and uh, is behind the film, Ronan McNamara, um, great to have you with us. He is coming to us live from Dublin, so that uh, shows you the dedication he's got to uh, <laughs> to uh, to discussing this, uh, the book and the movie, and congratulations on the movie. Uh, just a, a tremendous uh, a, a tremendous documentary. Completely fascinated and enthralled the audience that uh, watched it with me. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, it's, do you know what? It's um, one of those things, like I've been involved, we say, in journalism over the years and writing, and I've, but I've never been in a situation there I was in before the premiere of Rocky or Smuck in Boston. So it was premiered in front of, you know, an 800 person audience. And it was the first time that I was present for something where I was getting live audience feedback. You know, when you write something, people go away and read it. You don't actually get their reaction there and then they come back to you and tell you that they enjoyed it or hated it. But to actually be in a space where you're getting the live audience feedback and where you'd have, we say, laughter or sadness or clapping or in places that, you know, that you didn't expect to crop up, you know, uh, was an unusual experience for me. And just the reaction, I have to say, uh, to the film uh, since it's been released and since it's been broadcast on television here in Ireland and in Scotland has been incredible, really, and extremely heartening. Well, it, it it should be. I mean, it's it's this kind of a film. It's a it's a very different kind. It, it, you, at first, you start thinking, well, maybe this is like an ESPN thirty uh, thirty on thirty sort of thing. This is not that. This is a this is a really in depth look at not just Sean Mannion, but the communities in which he came from, the community in uh, Western Ireland, the community in Boston, and what was going on in those in those times. And I think that was what really kind of surprised me was how accessible this film will be for American audiences uh, and maybe talking about some of the tougher issues that Amer Americans faced in the 1970s and 1980s and right up until today. Yeah, it's funny. Do you know what? And I would say, actually, even Sean's story, you know, has been, I suppose, more, has been acknowledged more, I think, in the U.S. than in Ireland, up, we'll say, until this point. And I suppose that was part of my in a sense, motivation behind the book and then the film that, that came from the book, in that um, when I grew up, I grew up in Connemara in the west of Ireland, not too far from where Sean Mannion grew up. And when I was growing up, um, Sean Mannion was, you know, a childhood hero of mine. Uh, we were all in school, as I was nine years of age in 1984 when Sean fought for the world title. And for me, he was genuinely a hero. I mean, this was a guy at that time, I think the discourse has changed a bit, we say, around the Irish language in Ireland since then. But at that time, you know, if you were from the west of Ireland, um, you know, our, 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 our two USBs were immigration and that we still natively spoke Irish, you know, as a sign of poverty almost. But to have then someone to step out of that and not just, you know, nationally, but internationally to be on the world stage and to be proud of where he was from, you know, from the west of Ireland, not hiding it, proud of his language and putting it out there, you know, on... HBO, on ESPN, on the US, on the world stage. And for us, it was huge. I mean, it was a, you know, a big, big shift. And I was always fascinated by the story. But it wasn't, you know, Sean fought, uh, you know, all his pro fights almost exclusively in the US. And the only awareness of Sean as a boxer in Ireland was out of his, you know, tragic, really, uh, world title fight uh, against Mike McCallum. You know, that was shown live in Ireland. And, and, and beyond that, there was no real awareness of it. But I remember when I was writing the book uh, in, I think, in January 2013, I headed over to Boston. Uh, Sean had moved there and I wanted to hook up with him. You know, at a, there was a pro boxing night in the Boston Garden for the first time in five years. And I just wanted to be, you know, ringside with him for that. But, you know, to me, it blew me away because there were queues of people waiting to shake his hand. You know, and I'd, I'd, I'd ask Sean, you know, who's that? And he'd say, oh, yeah, such and such. He managed the world champion, you know, and, you know, 1973, and who's that? Oh, he he fought for the world welterweight title, you know, in 1982, and who's that? Oh, he's, he, he sold drugs for a he cocaine, he did 12 years in prison. <laughs> this, this litany of <laughs> random characters, 
and they're all there respecting Sean, um, asking for Sean. And if Sean attended the same fight nights in Ireland, there would be you know very few people. There wasn't that awareness of his story. Um, so I think that was one of the more heartening things for me, um, to, you know, that there is an awareness now of Sean and I suppose the context in which he fought and those interweaving stories. I mean, like, like I started out saying, until I started working on the book, you know, I was aware on a kind of a, I suppose, a macro scale, you know, of Sean's achievements. Uh, but I wasn't aware, you know, of how he got there or of the curious intersections between Sean's life and um, like some, I suppose, of the, the, the more unsavings uh, of Boston of that era. Yeah, Whitey Bulger, some of the crew around Whitey Bulger. Yeah, and th th that was actually the surprise for me because uh, just to let the audience know, I actually own the book, Rocky Rosmuk, which is in Irish. And as I think some of the people who um, watch, this, um, watch this show know, I'm learning Irish. Learning being the operative word, the progressive <laughs> form of the word learning. And I'm somewhere really close to the start of that progression. And so I haven't had a chance to read the book yet. It is coming out. And I do want to mention this uh, in English called The Man Who Was Never Knocked Down. And it's coming out in June. It's available for pre-order. And the link is in the show post for that. And uh, I am not going to buy the book in English because I am bound and determined that I am going to read this in Irish, and I am going to learn Irish enough so that I can read this book and enjoy it in Irish. And and you mentioned this. You mentioned the fact that uh, Sean Mannion has a a very um, a very heartfelt connection to the Irish language. His his emergence on the world boxing scene was a, a point of pride for people who who do use and love the Irish language. And uh, and certainly there was some Irish language in this film, mostly in the interviews. Um, there's a lot of English too, by the way. So if you get a chance to watch this film, don't be, you know, don't, don't be, uh, intimidated by this because it's a very accessible film. The, the Irish has subtitles, so you'll know what's going on, but uh, the, the, the Irish language has always been, I guess, in these communities, uh, and you hinted at this earlier, sort of this there's a dichotomy in how people feel about the Irish language. I'm talking about, you know, people in Ireland and, and native speakers. And uh, it, it seems to be blossoming more in the last 20, 30 years or so. I, I love the language. I think it's just a beautiful language. That's my attraction to it. Yeah, like there's a definite shift, I would say, we say in the past 20 years. I mean, if you took me an average age of 40 uh, in Ireland and looked at, we'd say, the favorability towards the language or how they were disposed uh, you know, the younger half of the population is considerably more positively disposed towards the language. There's less of the negative baggage that was around the language uh, as I grew up. Uh, but I, I mean, saying that, I grew up in a great or an Irish speaking area. So that baggage wasn't there within that area, but we were acutely aware of it. I mean, 20 years ago, uh, the representation um, of Irish speakers in, we'd say, the Sunday newspapers were drunken woolly jumper wearing uh hardcore republican right uh, you know and uh then i think you know one of the major shifts uh in the perception around the language i think was in 1996 uh tg Cahar or tg4 the irish language television station was founded and a tg4 actually was one of the primary funders of this of this film uh and then all of a sudden you know there were uh young, attractive female and male weather presenters on TV who weren't woolly jumper wearing drunkards who were playing tin whistle all day, you know, and it, <laughs> you know, it, it genuinely had a shift in the change of perception. I mean, I used to work, we'd say 20 years ago, I used to work uh, in the evening newspapers in, in Dublin, you know, and I'd get into a taxi to go on a story. And if this conversation started and somehow they found out, you know, where I was from or that I spoke Irish, it was just, it wasn't worth my while to go get into the conversation. It was just like, a negative fest. But when I get into a taxi today, uh, you know, I'm coming up from Galway to Dublin and I get off the train, I get into a taxi uh, and straight away it's a positive discourse. It's, oh yeah, I'm sending my child to an all uh, Irish speaking um, school, you know, I saw such and such on TG Cahar. Like there's a considerable shift in the attitude towards the language, uh, partly because of a change, you know, in, in we'd say in schools, uh, partly because of uh, TG Cahar. I would say as well, I wouldn't ignore the fact that um, 
the troubles in the north, in the north of Ireland, um, with the abatement of that, like the, the I suppose the uh, political identity and language is, is, is less of a thing than it was, you know. So right. I think it's a more it's a more accessible language for people now. But it's funny, you know, I, I, like you mentioned Sean, I like Sean and I this, you know, I mentioned this in the film, but Sean is a very principled uh, person, uh, sometimes or quite often to his own detriment. Uh, but among one of those principles, you know, those areas that he's principled about is the Irish language. And uh, when I approached him about the book, uh, he said, yeah, he said, you know, you're not the first person, he said. And he, 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 he mentioned a, a, a well-known Irish author uh, or a, a reporter to me who, who had approached him about writing the book. Uh, but he said, you know, he was going to write the book in English. And I always said, he said that uh, if I was going to have a book that would be in Irish first. So uh, that came from his principles came from me. And, and and there's actually a, a great story about his principles and me at, at his own expense. And that has to do with representing Ross Muck. And uh, this is this. I think this is a great story. And I think it really it it it, um, it really shows how tied he was uh, to his community, how how that was a point of honor and a point of pride for him. And I, I'm going to let you tell the story because obviously you tell it much better than I'm going to tell it. But uh, it had to do with his boxing trunks. Yeah. So at the time, um, the set, what well, I mean, boxing at that time was very lucrative, but only if you were a big name boxer. So if you were, we'd say, Sean was fighting for the world title on the undercard, you know, to Marvin Hagler, who I think was earning three million that night, and Sean was earning uh, thirty thousand uh, dollars. So um, a company had approached him, uh, a company called Warehards. Um, they're better known for their for their um, for their swimming. Uh, merchandise now, but at that time uh, they were, you know, I was trying to capitalize on the growth in boxing, and they had a a, a brand called Wearhard, a boxing brand, and they offered Sean five thousand dollars to have Wearhard written on the front, uh, on the waist of his trunks, and Sean said, "No, I can't do that." He said, "I already have uh, a brand on my on my trunks," and uh, you know. They they thought you know this was kind of a, a negotiation tactic on the on, on the part of Sean, and so they offered him ten thousand. They kept on going up in increments of uh, five thousand. They got to twenty five thousand dollars, almost the same amount of money Sean was going to get uh, to fight uh, for the fight itself. And in the end, the Warehard representative asked Sean, you know, uh, what is this brand? And he said, Russ Muck. I says, you know, well, you know, what does Russ Muck do? He says, basically, he said. Russ Muck produces people. So Sean, I mean, Russ Muck is, like, it's a small, I mean, even in an isolated, it's an isolated village. Uh, but, and it's an area of huge immigration. It's one of those areas, like, like it's, I mean, even in Ireland, I would say there are people, you know, where I am at the moment in the East Coast who wouldn't believe this. But, like, there are more connections between Russ Muck politically, socially, and economically and then there are between so between Russ Muck and Boston, then there are between Russ Muck and Dublin. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that's the kind of dynamic. It's an area that's been hit by immigration um, throughout throughout time. But an area, a community, it's a very, very strong community. I think, in a sense, because it's kind of like a peninsula off the mainland, it's almost an island. And I think that's kind of like nurtured uh, oneness between the people of Russ Muck. I think that comes across in, in, in Sean's character. It comes across in the movie too, and I think one of the one of the surprising aspects of this film was the knowledge that emigration from Ireland outward. I mean, I think I, some of us, uh, you know, knew this sort of right, you know, a little bit, um, but that it was still such a strong force in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. I think a lot of us, even those of us who are from Irish descent, and I'm four generations out from Irish descent on this. Um, think of it as a thing of the past, and and it, it really isn't, or at least it's it's not a thing of the distant past. It's a, If it's in the past, it's in the very recent past. And I think that was one of the more surprising aspects of this film, plus the, the, um, the strength of that um, Irish community and the Irish language in, in the Boston area where a lot of the people from that region were emigrating to. Yeah, it's like, I mean, when I was growing up, I would hear all the time about Boston. I would hear all the time about Dorchester. You know, I mean, I knew a Fields Corner in Dorchester. <laughs> I felt like centuries before I actually ever visited uh, <laughs> Fields Corner. 
you know. And like, I mean, Sean tells the story that, you know, when he went uh, to Boston, I mean, you'd walk up and down uh, uh, Dorchester Avenue in Dorchester and Irish was the spoken language. You know, you'd hear more Irish on Dorchester Avenue than you'd hear on Chop Street in Norway, uh, which is incredible, really. Uh, but, you know, there, you know, I mean, it was a closely knit community. I, I, I mean, in a sense, it's a reflection of the economic conditions, you know, in the areas where where those immigrants came from, um, you know, along the West Coast, Irish speaking areas. But, you know, it's funny that even, you know, obviously there isn't that same amount of immigration now. And even, you know, today, you know, perhaps it's a different kind of, you know, it's a, you know, you have more professionals. It's a different kind of, of immigration. But I even I was surprised during the making of the film, you know, I, um, like I came across a former classmate. I didn't know where he was, but I came across a former classmate, you know, on a building site that Sean was working on that I didn't know. I went into kind of a, a, a bar in Dorchester uh, and I met a number of people um, who, had, who I'd gone to school with or who were in the school while I was in school and that I hadn't seen since. So, you know, you know, there isn't that same deluge or that flood of immigration that I think that, that kind of finished up, you'll say, in the 70s, early 80s. But, it, you know, it still exists. I mean, there's still a very close contemporary bond, I would say, between Boston and Connemara, not, which is not just between those who immigrated, we'll say, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, but even to this day, you know. And, and, and again, I mean, I think that that is one of the more enlightening parts of this film, as well as some of the, I mean, I, I was in a room of people who were, who are learning Irish or are Irish speakers, some of them, and some who are just really appreciate uh, Irish fine arts. Um, this was part of a uh, fine arts uh, festival that's going on here in the Twin Cities is the reason why this was being shown. And, uh, and I think I talked with a few people at the end of this and they all came away saying, I didn't know this about what was going on. I didn't know that about, I didn't know, they didn't know that the Irish language was so strong in Dorchester as you just got done saying. And I think a lot of the things going around with um, some of the folks uh, with uh, Whitey Bulger's gang, uh, there was one passage, I think it took everybody's breath away. You could just hear the audible gasp in the room. Uh, there was, there's this fascinating character that gets interviewed in the film and I can't remember his name. It's, I, I think, yes, thank you. Yeah. And there was this one remarkable moment in this, uh, and and he was he was he, he spent time in prison for armed robbery. He spent time in prison for running guns to Northern Ireland, and about that he's asked, I, 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 "Were you the interviewer for this, um, or was somebody else doing that interview?" Actually, the director did that interview. The director did that interview. The director sort of uh, asks him whether or not he regrets it, and I'll let you describe Nee's reaction because I tell you. That got a physical reaction in the room that I was uh, that I was in watching this film. Yeah, I was in the room uh, while that interview took place, and um, I didn't see I didn't see the answer. So, so the question was around. I didn't see the answer coming. I can say, but yeah. the question was around um, Pat Nee's basically was running guns uh, and you know, ammunition and you know, all sorts of armaments uh, into Ireland from Boston. Uh, and the shipment was intercepted uh, by the Irish Navy. Uh, and um, there was an interview uh, you know, on the news at the time, and it's in the, it's in, it's in the documentary, uh, with the Taoiseach, the then Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, Gareth Fitzgerald, you know, who questions why people are sending these guns, you know, where Irishmen are killing Irishmen. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and then it cuts to Pat Nee, and uh, Michael Fanning, the director, asks him, Pat Nee, um, did you not think what these uh, guns were going to be used for? And he looks at him and answers, if you're looking for a conscience, you're not going to get it. <laughs> it's an amazing and, statement. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's some line. <laughs> it's some line. It's funny that like that line has gotten different reactions in different places. Um, you know, there was a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, stunned silence, for example, in Dublin and Galway. Very, very, very silent reaction in Rossmuck. I think because you know Patney is originally from Rossmuck. Uh, in Boston, I you know overstate. This is overstating it, but it was almost like comic relief in places. You know, um, 
but yeah, there, I, I was kind of surprised by the reactions in the different places to that. You know, different societies and different contexts give different reactions, and just to see, to see, and, and that showed up a lot around around Patney and you know, and what he had to say in his role. Um, but yeah, regardless of the audience, regardless of the audience, once the once the film was over, you know, uh, and people would come up to you know discuss it with me afterwards. That knee was always the, the first character they mentioned. Well, and and I mean, it, 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 certainly it's it's worth remarking on. But uh, let, let's finish up by talking about Sean Mannion because yeah, th there's there is a uh, there's an arc to stories, and maybe especially so in boxing. Very few, very few men come up through boxing to rise to the level that Sean Mannion did, and then have a really good arc afterwards. And mm. and. This 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 the film Rocky Ross Mook takes a very honest look at uh, Sean Mannion's career and his life afterward, and it's not all great news. And yet, he really just has a certain dignity that he maintains throughout all of this. I mean, it's 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 I think a testament to his his character and his fortitude. Um, and I'm wondering what your reaction was as you're going through all of this, as you're writing the book, as, as the film's going along, putting all this together. How do you see the 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 second half, if you will, of Sean Mannion's life? I don't know. I think, you know what, I think my own view has kind of evolved uh, as, you know, the whole project or the projects went on. I mean, I remember asking uh, his lawyer at the time, uh, was Tony Cardinale, who happened to be um, John Gotti's uh, lawyer, who happened to be the person who revealed the connection between the FBI and Whitey Bulger, uh, and just so happened to be Sean's lawyer as well. Uh, and uh, Tony would be very well versed in the world of boxing. He was the manager of John Ruiz, the first ever um, uh, Hispanic uh, heavyweight champion of the world. But I asked, you know, I asked Tony, you know, in another time or place, you know, would Sean have won the world title? Should Sean have, you know, regrets? Was he shortchanged in places? There was poor management, different circumstances. And his reaction is, well, you know, like so many people, you know, try to do what Sean did. And Sean managed to fight for the world title in the most competitive era of, um, you know, of that weight division in boxing's history. Right. And he said, you know, like, if nothing else, he should, you know, very few people can say that. Uh, and who, you know, who knows? I mean, really, I think, like, Sean, Sean's arc, I suppose, would have been a bit different, I would say. If, you know, would have been very different if it wasn't for, you know, his own principles. And his own yeah. principles, in the end, led him to believe that he let Ireland down. I think there's a very poignant line yes. in the film where he says... You know, and we're in the context of this stage of this film, you know, in the context of his drinking. And he's saying, you know, it's very difficult to go to bed at night on your own when you believe you've let your country down. And he believe he let, he let his country down because he didn't win the world title. Um, but uh, the question, I remember the question at one of the screenings. I don't know if the, the particular uh, audience member felt short change, you know, because, you know, in regardless of the film be it a kind of a documentary or 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 fiction you know you expect some sort of happy ending you know yes and the person question stood up and said you know where where the hell is the redemption here you know <laughs> I mean, was like, they were just waiting for it you know i felt like telling me you know in, in rocky ross mook 2 he goes on to win the, win the world title but i didn't say that but, yeah. uh, but he's he's I, in a sense, you know, like I thought about it, like this was a Q&A session, and I thought about it, and I said, well, do you know what? Like there is a redemption, and the redemption is his character. And you touched on that, Ed, when you started asking that question. I mean, that's exactly right. The redemption is in his character. I mean, there are very few people that you will meet who will have anything other than a positive word to say about Sean Mann. And that says, that says something for someone who who earned his living in the fight game, uh, who is an alcoholic, um, who's had relationship difficulties, and this is not in the film itself, but, you know, who's had, you know, run-ins with the law. Mm -hmm. And yet, you will have, you won't really meet someone who will speak negatively on him. 
like that's the one thing that we found when we were making the film you know uh, like some of the, you know obviously the likes of Patney the likes of um, Red Shea uh, who served time uh, dealing for dealing cocaine for, for Whitey Bulger uh, the likes of Mickey Ward former world champion you know uh, these are you know not easily accessible people uh, and you know we thought we'd have you know a bit of bit of work to try and get them involved in the film but once they that it was for Sean Mannion that said anything for Sean. It, it was incredible. Like it, it opened up all the doors. Just Sean's name because of the respect for him. And I think in the end, if nothing else, he has that. And perhaps as well, finally, you know, through the book in Irish and the film and, you know, with the booking out in English, that he'll also, that he also, I suppose, gets the acknowledgement for what he achieved and perhaps that, you know, he can, he can sleep better at night. Uh, I, I just, uh, um, after the screening in, in, in Boston, someone stood up and said, you know, Sean, you know, uh, can you not see that you did not let down the people of Ireland? We're, you know, we're extremely uh, proud of you. And Sean was on the stage with me and the director. And, you know, he, 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 you know Sean's a very quiet spoken, humble person. And he kind of like mumbles, I picked up the mic, was a moment. You know, I, I don't know. He said, I don't know. And then we had a screening at the Galway Film Club, the Galway Film Festival. And <clears throat> the same thing again. Someone stood up. The first question in the Q and A was, you know, Sean, can you not see that? You know, we're intensely proud of you. You did not let down the people of Ireland. And, and Sean was, mm, I, I, you know, he after another fifteen minute ovation, like, no, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't really believe that. So the third screening, and that screening was sold out. There were two sold out screenings in Galway. The third screening, someone stood up, you know, and said, Sean, you know, you did not let down the people of Ireland. Can you not see that? Uh, I think I'm beginning to find Lisi. <laughs> <you know? laughs> If nothing, if nothing else, you know, maybe that would come out of it. Well, and I think that that's, I, I was just about to make the same point before you brought it up, is that if nothing else, the film Rocky Rusmuk, the book Rocky Rusmuk in Irish, and soon to be the man who was never knocked down, Sean Mannion was, never went to the canvas in his career, the man who was never knocked down is coming out in June in English, um, and that is that is my backup plan, but I, I can't tell Ronan that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no, it's not true, it's well, not yeah. true. The the, the the English word like the English word he also wins the world title in the English word. See, actually, do you know what? Yeah, do you know what? Uh, the, the one thing you know, I'm sure you find this yourself. You know, we, you know, if you're writing or broadcasting, it's the frustration that crops up all the time. You do something right, and you put it out there, and people come up to you afterwards. Oh, that was great, but you know, what? oh, if only I with little nuggets of information <laughs> that you, and it's so frustrating. But the great thing about doing an English version of the book is that all of those little nuggets of information that I hadn't had before have uncovered themselves, you know. So if you've read the Irish book, there's still great value in the English book. See, <laughs> so, I, so I'll read both. See, this is the thing. I'm going to end up reading Ooh, yeah. both. Yeah. I clearly have to do that. Giving, yeah. Both Rocky Rusmuk and The Man Who Was Never Knocked Down. And, and we're almost out of time. Just really quickly, though, Ronan, is there, are there plans to do a, a wider release of the film in the United States, because I really honestly think that this is a film that is so accessible and says so much about America as well as about um, as well as about Ireland and just the human condition overall. This is a film that I think Americans could embrace. You know, as, as much as they ever embraced documentaries, we're not really well known for that. But to the extent that we do, I, I would I, I certainly would love to be able to recommend this to people here that where they can go see this. Yeah, uh, I'm not. I mean, that would be great. It did a week. In the cinema in New York, LA, and Boston, as well as some, you know, some one-off festivals. But beyond that, I'm not entirely sure. Ed. I, you know, I think it's tied up in a sense now with with TG TG Car in terms of sure. um, broadcasting rights. But after that, I mean, I would love the you know, um, I would love it, for example, to get you know an airing on, on on TV in the US. You know, I think, uh, you know, people who are interested in boxing go to it, and enjoy. It. People who have no interest in going boxing, and some, you know hesitantly go to it or out of obligation go to it and say you know are come back to me you know and express surprise that it's you know so much more than that like yes. it's just you know not just it's not a boxing story it's not just an immigration story you know it's not just a hard look tragedy um you know it's got a lot of different elements interwoven interwoven into each other it certainly does well if nothing else we'll wait for it to come out in blu-ray and, uh, and, and hopefully that'll be sometime soon, because if, uh, if we can't get it in any other way, we can always just buy it and put it in our collection. Rocky Rosmuk is the film. Rocky Rosmuk is the book in Irish. The Man Who Was Never Knocked Down, coming out in June. Ronan McConamera, thank you so much for um, allowing me to butcher your name. And thank you so much for being here 
on the show. <laughs> Next time I talk to you, I'll, ta I'll, I'll try out my very bad Irish, but uh, this time I'm just a little too self-conscious. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ed.